Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the Fast Friday edition of the show for October 1st, 2021. And on this episode, I've got a very brief overview of what I see as the five worst presidential executive orders, executive directives, whatever you want to call them, in history. They run across the political spectrum. And I think these are just more examples. There's so many of them to show that you can't trust anyone with power. Even if you like the person in power, as soon as there's an emergency, they're going to do something to respond to that emergency. They expand their power and they set a precedent which can last generations and generations and maybe even forever. But first of all, before getting to that, I wanted to mention that our show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. And there you're going to find everything you need to follow the show. Primarily, all the different platforms are on, both video and audio only, just in case we happen to be missing from where you listen to us or you watch us on a regular basis. One day, all of a sudden, we're just gone. You can go to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty and find tons of other platforms, including odyssey.com, which is decentralized and censorship resistant like no other, at least as of now. You can also find our membership program there and all the archives for this show for over three years. The membership program, you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. We make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and liberty. Again, the show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. Thank you so much. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this info out to you in the first next 10 to 15 minutes. First, before getting into these top five, I want to start with a foundation. We can start with Montesquieu, who, of course, was incredibly influential on the founding generation. This is uh, James Madison technically quoting him. It's a paraphrase in Federalist 47. And this is one of the main principles under which they were uh, separating the powers between the executive and the legislative branch. There can be no liberty where the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or body of magistrates. And Madison was reiterating that to point out you can't have any liberty if you merge these together. Even if you like the results short term, in the long run, you're in a lot of trouble. And Madison followed that up with this. The magistrate in whom the whole executive power resides cannot of himself make a law. That's the father of the Constitution, or so-called in Federalist number 47. And with that as our foundation, let's go through these, what I see is the top five worst. The only order they're in is chronological. We're starting from the oldest one and going to the most recent. And I know there are many, many others that need to be covered, but these are the ones that I threw together because I thought it was really interesting here from Abraham Lincoln, April 27th, 1861. They weren't numbering them as executive orders at the time. That came in the uh, early 20th century, I believe. This was an order to General Scott to suspend habeas corpus between the city of Philadelphia and the city of Washington. Now, mind you, the Constitution does not delegate a power to the executive branch to be able to do this. This is a very specifically a congressional power to be used in very limited situations. So even if you think that this was OK to be done, it's not something that should have been done on the unilateral authority of the executive branch. And people in Congress, I think, recognize this at the time as well, because they tried to actually pass legislation to make it legal after the fact. So basically do it first. Do what you think is you got to do and then see if Congress will pass it. They tried. They failed very shortly after this. They tried a second time, maybe even a third time. So that at, at the very least, they tried to pass legislation in Congress to authorize what the executive did on his own twice and failed. They finally got it through in 1863. But by that point, there was a lot of anger in Maryland and other places, of course, uh, uh, Lincoln actually expanded on this in places up to Bangor, Maine and elsewhere. 
But some of the results were pretty wild. Check this out, a good overview over at Wiki. They say during this period in Maryland, one sitting U.S. congressman from the opposing party, that's how it always is, that's the way it was in the Alien and Sedition Acts when, I mean, this is not an executive order, but when John Adams signed that into law, you couldn't bring any member of the uh, federal government into ill repute unless it was Thomas Jefferson, the sitting vice president of the opposing party. So during this period when... uh, Habeas was suspended in Maryland. One sitting congressman from the opposing party, as well as the mayor, police chief, entire board of police and the city council of Baltimore were all arrested without charge, no charge and imprisoned indefinitely without trial. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney of the Supreme Court held that the suspension was unconstitutional, stating that only Congress could do this. Lincoln and his attorney general, Edward Edward Bates not only ignored the chief justice's order, but when Lincoln's dismissal of the ruling was criticized in an editorial by prominent Baltimore newspaper editor, Frank Key Howard, they also had this editor arrested by federal troops without charge or trial. Frank Key Howard is a pretty prominent dude of the time. This is Francis Scott Key's grandson. And this is, he was in Fort McHenry, the same fort where the Star Spangled Banner had been waving or the land of the free. That was his grandfather's song. So it's pretty fascinating that that happened. They also arrested, I believe, about a third of the Maryland General Assembly without charge, without trial. And the anger ran so, so deep in Maryland uh, that there was a state song from 1939 in 2021. It was just changed this year. I'm not sure what they went to. It's called Maryland, My Maryland. It was a poem of the time. They made it into the state song and they specifically referred to Abraham Lincoln as a tyrant. This really ran deep in Maryland for a long time. That's the first one. Uh, Lincoln's order to suspend habeas in Maryland. There were others. The second one is executive order 6102 from FDR. This is April 5th, 1933. It required, again from Wiki, all persons to deliver on or before May 1st, 1933, all but a small amount of gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates owned by them to the Federal Reserve in exchange for $20.67 per troy ounce. Now, this was a real bait and switch, and they definitely got screwed over because shortly after people turned it in, then they repegged the value per ounce to 35 bucks. I mean, what a ripoff. I covered this in some detail in an episode early last year, taking the gold FDR's executive order 6102. I will link to that in the show notes. I think it's really, really interesting stuff. The third one is a twofer. This is also from FDR. Wow, we got a lot of them coming from here. Executive Order 9066. This is an article by Mike Meharry. It authorized the Secretary of War and the U.S. Army to create military zones, quote, from which any or all persons may be excluded. You're probably familiar with what happened if you're not really already aware of 9066. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of street art and posters and things in my neighborhood where they talk about this to this day. The order left who might be excluded to the military's discretion. When FDR, Mike writes, inked his name to EO 9066 on February 19, 1942, it opened the door for the roundup of some 120,000 Japanese, most of which were American citizens and Japanese citizens living along the West Coast of the U.S. and their imprisonment in concentration camps. They like to call them internment camps. They really were concentration camps. And it wasn't just Japanese. There were others, but it was primarily uh, Japanese. Here's Dave Benner on it. He says, cruelly reminiscent of anti-Jewish programs enacted by the Third Reich, Roosevelt's decree was a clear-cut violation of the Fifth Amendment guarantee to life, liberty, and property. The order was also imposed by executive decree, bypassing Congress and appearing as the command of an all-powerful monarch. And people have treated the executive branch like that for a long time. Roosevelt, Dave writes, engaged in efforts to relocate citizens by issuing a secondary decree, EO 9102, which specifically established the War Relocation Authority. I've, you know, I've read through the Constitution. I've not seen anything authorized 
like this. Of course, we have people on one side of the spectrum or another who will always say, well, it was an emergency. You got to do something. But there is no emergency clause in the Constitution. All they're authorized to do is follow the Constitution. Nothing more. That is it. And if they don't like the limitations of power, they have to advocate for an amendment. Dave continues. He says the new federal institution was bestowed the power to forcibly seize and relocate individuals into the camps. My favorite uh, local bakery here in Little Tokyo in downtown Los Angeles, they have a long history. They've been open since the early 1900s. It's the oldest, I think, ongoing business or the oldest business in the area. Of course, those people, the family that ran it, they were taken away to these concentration camps and somehow they survived and it still exists today. I'm not sure if it was closed during those years and run by other people or if it was fully confiscated. I should learn a little bit more about that at some point. But those are my next two, 9066 and 9102 from FDR. And the last one from Ronald Reagan, Executive Order 12333. This is from epic.org. This was signed by Reagan on December 4th, 1981, just a few days after my birthday, in case anyone's wondering. Uh, I was born in 72, though, December 1st. It established a broad new surveillance authority for the intelligence community outside the scope of public law, and I would say outside the scope of the Constitution as well. Here they say, be careful when someone from the intelligence community uses the caveat, not under this program. That's important because we hear these terms or these phrases of art by the spies all the time. Oh, no, no, no. We're not doing that kind of surveillance under this program or under this authority. Almost certainly, they write, it means that whatever it is they're denying is done under is is actually done under some other program or authority. And one, two, three, three, three is a big one. We often think of NSA spying or warrantless surveillance as being done under the Patriot Act, for example, the call detail record program, or they'll tell us, well, we haven't renewed this program. We're not using doing surveillance under that program anymore, but they're most certainly doing it under 12 triple three. And here, an article from McClatchy a few years ago, the impact of one, two, three, 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 or 12 triple three is enormous and largely unknown. Documents leaked by Edward Snowden suggest that less than half of the metadata that the NSA has collected as of the time of this article some years ago had been acquired under the Patriot Act and FISA, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the two laws that have received the most in attention for permitting NSA programs. So he's saying less than 50% of the warrantless surveillance is actually being done under the so-called authorities or laws or whatever you want to call them that most people are paying attention to. The majority then is done under 12 triple three and general Keith Alexander, who was NSA director at that point had ratified that impression. They write saying that the majority of NSA data is collected solely, and this is in his words, solely pursuant to the authorities provided by executive order 12 triple three. I did a whole episode on this back in March of 2019 when they were saying all over the place, we're hearing that uh, NSA surveillance is being stopped, but it was being stopped under a certain program. We know that 12 triple three still exists and they're going to continue using it no matter what. There are a number of others that I could have included. I'm sure you've got some that you're thinking about as well. I'd love to hear uh, which ones, which executive orders you think are the worst in history. Of course, there's other ones like uh, nationalizing the steel industry. The Supreme Court, thankfully, overturned that one. That was from Truman. We've got Bush uh, authorizing additional NSA spying. We also have Bush creating the terrorist screening center, which was used to create the no-fly list, which is going to be used in many other ways today and in the future. But there's a lot of them. I hope you found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope it made you think, and I'm interested in your feedback. Of course, if you want to um, help us spread the word, please consider doing a few free, easy-peasy things to trigger the algorithm of the mainstream platforms you may watch or listen on. Reviews on Apple Podcasts. Uh, smashing the like button on YouTube or Facebook or anywhere else, leaving comments primarily in the archive, all that stuff will help us get the program out to more people. And as I mentioned earlier on, our membership program starts out as little as two bucks a month. You can find that over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, thank you for being here. I hope you have a great weekend and I'll see you next week here on the path to liberty.